Elementals, written by Stephen Vincent Benet, read by Edward E. French. Part One The human soul is a house of many fantastic chambers, but for most of us, as we go our way easily through life, the most curious of those chambers are the least frequented. Bluebeard's closet we would not unriddle if we could. Blank doors we gape at in passing with a little wonder, perhaps, but with more relief that we, who are safe in our everydayness, will never be called upon to turn the key in the lock and face the incredible things within. There are almighty things behind those doors. There is beauty so intense that it burns on the mind like fiery water, much agony, hideous fear, and many torments. And after the torments are past, a certain sense that seems to its wounded possessors priceless, a, a sense and memory of impossible things endured. Not easily nor often do the doors swing open. They will not budge for the catchwords of ordinary speech. It is only the elemental forces of the naked and crying soul that will suffice to move them, the elemental powers, fear, hunger, love, and hate. And this is just. And it is just that the doors should open seldom, for the man upon whom they have opened even for an instant will never be the same again. When Sherwood Latimer had accepted the invitation of his temporary employer John Slake to a little dinner for two in the big, ugly residence on Madison Avenue that was always so obtrusively guarded by private detectives, for so many fanatics seemed to feel it their duty to try and assassinate the first millionaire in America, it was no idea at all of opening those doors or encountering anything more elemental than well-cooked food. But after the coffee he and Slake had got to talking— about Latimer's just-finished job in the first place, that excellent translation of Carlo Guicciardini's rare sixteenth-century pamphlet that Slake had bought in his last bandit raid on European art collections, about sixteenth-century Italy in general, and why Latimer, in spite of his twenty-five years, was the best man to be got on sixteenth-century Italian in the country. About universities, Latimer was going back to Harvard as an assistant in history in the fall, and the ludicrousness of the contrast between the salaries paid American teachers and the energy, personality, and wide knowledge expected of them, and then slashingly down into the elementals of life itself. What ruled this curious thing called human existence? What forces swayed it most wholly, and made it pageant or tragedy, or only gray succession of lackluster days? They made an odd contrast as they stared at each other across the tablecloth. The lean, hungry-looking young man in the shabby dress suit, so obviously a family relic. The sleek, tigerish, diverse figure in the perfectly fitting dinner coat, with his voice as soft and purring as the voice of a gigantic cat. An even odder contrast when they had once begun to argue for the argument concerned the essential invisible power that rules all human affairs. That force, quoth Latimer, was the love of a man for the one woman, and he defended his youthful proposition with a vigor most unacademic in its skill and intensity, in spite of all Slake's grumblings of, Bosch, my friend, pure Bosch. There are only three prime movers in this vagrant piece of oddity we are pleased to call the human soul. Fear, hunger, and hate. The little ormolu clock on the mantelpiece had chimed eleven some minutes before. They had been contending two hours over their point, and in spite of all Slake's mockingly perfect examples of human cowardice and weakness and insufficiency, he had not been able to make his opponent budge one inch from his original position. The elder man leaned forward in his chair now, regarding the younger, his eyes widening and glowing like those of a great smooth beast when it walks in the darkness from a lighted place. His voice, when it came again, had the slow throb and insistence of a savage drum. Good. You persist. You stick to your guns and your illusions in spite of any facts that I can adduce. Very well. 
Let us take another instance. From Guicciardini this time. He spoke slowly and thoughtfully. You will remember the incident. Your translation of it was flawlessly terse, by the way. In the chapter on the merry diversions of His Highness, Prince Alessandro, Latimer twisted uneasily. He did remember the incident as it happened, one of those pieces of cruel and sensitive torture in which that mad Renaissance prince had taken such a refined and exquisite delight. Leaving out those few details which are rather heady for a modern stomach, the two lovers whose devotion was a proverb in his court, the two lovers who were ready to undergo anything in life or death for each other, their devotion came to the ears of Alessandro, and he, like myself, had somewhat of a practical executive's tendency for testing promises by performance. He suggested a test of this immortal devotion, a very simple test. You remember what the reward was to be if the test were withstood? It was liberal enough. A dukedom for the man, a permanent revenue for them both, titles of honor, the title of Most Faithful in Love was the one which he had appropriately selected, if I recall rightly. If the test were not withstood, the penalty was death, of course. And Alessandro had always been an experimenter in curious methods of making people die. And you will remember that, though it appeared they had little choice in the matter, even so the lovers were genuinely delighted to accept the test. They embraced it, says Guicciardini, as if they were to dance together at a feast day, with great nobleness and joy of heart. But, unfortunately, the test was an elemental one, and when Alessandro heard of their eagerness, I can imagine that he smiled. In fact, I can see him smiling. He smiled himself, and a resemblance that had long been pricking at him resolved itself with a shudder in Latimer's mind. That was where Slake came from, certainly. From his merciless power in leash to his taste for all that was super exquisite in art. From the hot, cruel, gorgeous first youth of awakening Italy. He had no real part in twentieth-century America at all. Latimer stared at him as he might have at Alessandro come alive again in all his leopard subtlety and strength and raven. Slake went on. The test was to be by hunger. Elemental hunger. For ten days they were to be kept in adjoining rooms, a strong glass partition between so they could see each other but neither encourage each other by conversation nor plan for the future. They were given water lest they die of thirst, and so spoil the jests. Water, but nothing more. On the tenth day, but at an hour known to neither of them since they had been left no means for calculating time, which is a refinement on which I must really congratulate Alessandro, the glass partition was to be removed, and one piece of bread thrown into them as meat is thrown into a place where two starving animals are caged together. On their mutual behavior, as regarded that piece of bread, depended the success or failure of the test. Slake paused, and Latimer brushed his hand across his eyes for a moment. Slake's voice had made the picture indecently vivid. The two hunger-bitten creatures in their gay court dresses, gaping with licking lips and avid eyes at that one precious scrap of food. Well, you know the rest. Alessandro's faith in his elemental was justified. Guicciardini says that it was difficult for the men who were to take them to execution to separate them at first. They had torn and entwined their way into such a deadly knot in their death grapple for the unique possession of that one small piece of bread. And the bread was spoilt between them. Neither got any good of it. And yet if this elemental love of theirs had been greater than elemental hunger for one half hour, for Alessandro was just enough to provide that time limit, well, they both would have had their heart's desire forever and been 
most faithful in love. Well? He looked at Latimer with narrowed, lambent eyes. Alessandro was a mad monster, a cruel devil, said Latimer shakily. Perhaps. But he was also a practical man, and in this case a fair one. He merely wished to see if their professions had any value. If they had, he stood ready to reward them very magnificently. But they proved to have no value at all. It wasn't a fair test. Not by any means a fair test, said Latimer. Starvation, death by starvation, that was too much, too horrible. And then suddenly giving them food. And then just because they lost their heads for a moment, they, they lost their heads, Slake smiled. But before they lost them, they had proved in their own persons that hunger is greater than love. The test was too hard for them, you say? But a few minutes ago you were saying with apparent conviction that no test could be too hard. At all events, I think I have proved my point. No, said Latimer rebelliously. They would have died for each other. Of course they would. Even Guicciardini admits that. It, it was the means, the dragging out. It was hunger. The elemental. They acted as any two people would have acted. Oh, I don't blame them. Believe me. For myself, I should have acted in precisely the same way, except that I think I would have managed to get the piece of bread. He smiled. Yes, I think I would have. Oh, they were in love. Of course they were. Probably more in love than most people dare to be now. But their love, whatever its dimensions, was smaller than their hunger. Their hunger ate them up. Any two would have been the same. He settled back more comfortably. Any two would not, said Latimer violently. They failed because their love wasn't big enough, certainly. But some people would have been big enough. Some loves would. You can't... And he hesitated and stopped. The purr had come back into Slake's voice. Then I haven't convinced you. Even by such a perfect instance... That seems odd. Some people would have been big enough, you say. I wonder, I very much wonder, Mr. Latimer, just what people you mean. Oh, dozens, said Latimer vaguely. Most people, he went on stoutly, or half of them at any rate, even now. Yes, said Slake softly, yes. Then he stiffened suddenly in his chair. Would you? Latimer was taken completely aback. If the question had come at the beginning of the conversation, he merely would have treated it as an insult. But now he was both too angry at Slake and too interested in trying to refute him for that. Why, I don't know, Mr. Slake. Why, why the premise is preposterous, of course. Such a thing couldn't happen now. But suppose it could, Mr. Latimer. Suppose it could. That particular thick sleekness of scorn was the last drop of fuel on the silent, intense flame of Latimer's internal wrath. Yes, he said defiantly, and then wondered why on earth he had said it. You would be willing to wager your future professorship, say, on your and one woman's ability to withstand Alessandro's test? You are wholly certain of that? Yes, said Latimer again, more composedly. At least he had managed to take most of the contempt out of Slake's low voice. You are absolutely sure of yourself and the lady in question? Young Sherwood Latimer smiled. Catherine and himself. How ridiculously simple with them a thing like Alessandro's test would be. Something to joke about. They were so sure. Very well, then. Suppose we try it, Slake said amazingly. What? No, really, I'm not suggesting anything so impossible as that seems. The stakes first. Let me see the stakes. 
He smiled freezingly. Your idea would be so fantastic if it weren't so insolent, Mr. Slake. The stakes, Slake went on, unheeding. As I am not Alessandro, and a great pity it is, I can hardly request you to put up your lives as a forfeit. A written promise from you that you would give up your present career forever and enter any business I wished you to at a salary entirely at my own discretion. That would be quite sufficient in case either one of you failed. From the lady, I should naturally require no promise at all. The loss of your career would be quite sufficient to make you both wholly miserable for a number of years in case you married. If you did marry, which, if either of you failed in such a test, I should hardly imagine you would care to do. He paused for Latimer to speak, but Latimer seemed to have no words. Should the test be withstood successfully, and I should not require a longer period than twenty minutes for its actual duration, a check for ten thousand dollars to be delivered to you the same day. He smiled again. Latimer shivered. Ten thousand dollars. That meant that he and Catherine could marry at once instead of waiting another year. It meant leisure for research, to do the work that he wanted. It meant a home, and children being able to afford to have children safely, without fear, without every summer spent in hack tutoring, without Catherine's being worn to the bone by the pinching, inexorable grip of their honorable poverty. It meant security. It meant everything that both of them wanted most in life. Ten thousand dollars. He sighed tiredly. It was like John Slake to dangle all these things like a golden feather so casually, so nearly in reach of his hand, so utterly and completely on conditions that he could never accept. If he had only required some other conditions, any other ones, I suppose you think you have the right to play practical jokes of this sort on your employees, Mr. Slake, he stammered. Or rather, you haven't the right, but you seem to have the power. The thing is utterly impossible, of course, even supposing I accepted, which I wouldn't and couldn't. You have neither the power nor the means. Power? Means? My dear Mr. Latimer, you are hardly flattering. But... This is the twentieth century, said Latimer platitudinously. The twentieth century. Exactly. That is why. The century of all centuries where money is power. I made a rather interesting statistical computation a year or so ago, he smiled. As to the legal penalties I should have incurred for a few little things I have found it necessary to do at one time or another, they amounted, in the aggregate, to a prison sentence of one hundred and fourteen years. He leaned forward, looking at Latimer intently. The sheer force and will of him seemed to flow into the other man's body like an electric wave. "'My servants are well trained,' he said slowly. "'They should be at their salaries. The better ones, and I have several, are quite beyond the possibility of surprise at any whim I may happen to wish carried out.' Well, on the third floor there is a little suite of soundproof rooms, a miniature apartment, seven rooms in all. I use it whenever a problem chances to come up that I wish to think over entirely undisturbed. The meals are sent up on a dumb waiter, the species of waiter that, on the whole, I prefer. We could carry out our little experiment there in perfect peace. He waved his hands defensively in the air. Oh, I shouldn't make the conditions nearly as hard as Alessandro's. The glass screen was a pretty idea, but a little expensive. I could have a window put in that would do just as well. The apartment is sizable enough. I should stay in it, of course, for the duration of the experiment. Meals would be sent up from the kitchen for three. He grinned like a dog. But naturally only one person could eat them. Myself. You would be in one room, the young lady in the room adjoining. The rest of the apartment would be mine. You would not have food, but water in any quantity would be yours at your convenience. As for cleanliness, I think I could arrange matters so that you would have a bathroom apiece, in consideration of the fact that neither of you, in all probability, possesses a Renaissance physique. I would be perfectly willing to shorten the time to seven days. Just consider, he seemed to be speaking very earnestly, a seven days fast. 
a thing any one of a score of health cranks undergo voluntarily several times a year, a fast that no reputable early Christian hermit or modern explorer would treat as anything but a joke. There was that Irishman, the Lord Mayor of Cork. He lasted, how long was it? Almost a month, I believe. Nearly five times the paltry number of hours I am asking you to hold out. And, moreover, if you will permit me, a fast with every modern convenience at your disposal in a well-lighted, well-heated apartment. For I should differ from some of Alessandro's quaintest conceits in that respect. Books? He ruminated. I shall consider whether I could allow you books. Anything else in reason, certainly. Well, Mr. Latimer? You accept, of course? Of course not, said Latimer firmly. Really? But why? Ten thousand dollars for one week's lack of occupation. You will never have a chance like that in all your life. And, of course, you are sure of winning, or we would never have had any argument. Ten thousand dollars now, when life is just beginning for both of you, when you need money more than you will ever need it again. Ten thousand dollars. His voice was as gradual and insistent as the pulsing throb of a drum. But what in God's name would you expect to get out of your ridiculous proposal, said Latimer suddenly, out of an overmastering curiosity. Slake sank back in his chair again, his eyes filmed like a praying eagle's. Amusement, he said slowly. A man as rich as I am, Mr. Latimer, is the hardest person under the sky to amuse. He has tasted most things. Too early. In the old days there were gladiatorial games for such men, and that was as it should be. You see, that is always amusing. That one thing. One can be bored ineffably by all other things in the world, but not by that. The struggle of life against elemental chance. The struggle of life to live. His voice sank to a cruel cadence. To look on. To see men fighting with the paltry weapons of men against something too strong to conquer. Bleeding. Dying. He looked at the tablecloth as if the blood he was speaking of lay on it like a stain. That is... Most intensely amusing, he said a little hoarsely. And what I have proposed, Mr. Latimer, is just such a spectacle. On a small scale, of course, but that would make it only the more poignant. The terror, the fear, the, the amusement would be refined and thrice refined. And besides, he changed again. I admire your brains, Mr. Latimer, he said briskly. I could use you. If I could be sure of utter obedience from you, you might make me a very valuable servant in many ways. But anything I offered you now in reason you would refuse. You are such a stubborn young man, so sure of your own career. Should you lose, I would have that obedience. Oh, you're a gentleman. You wouldn't break your word. I should have the absolute use of you, like an extra finger for, say, ten years. That gamble, you see, why, that would double the amusement. Well, I offer. And I refuse, said Latimer for the last time. He rose. I really must be going to bed now, Mr. Slake. I have some correspondences to attend to. His voice trailed off uncertainly. Slake remained seated, his eyes smoldering still with that vision of proud life beaten into the dust by the odds against it, which his words had conjured up. You will always remember this, though. When you're poor and at your wit's end, he said sardonically, that you might have had ten thousand dollars for the asking, in exchange for a little courage. Perhaps I shall, Latimer, was past caring for Slake's purr of mockery now. 
I'll be frank, Mr. Slake. If you'd made your insane offer to myself alone, <laughs> I'd have jumped at it, he laughed. But as it is, of course, Slake purred. Of course. The young lady, she could not bear it, of course. Well, perhaps it is just as well, Mr. Latimer. You will be able to keep a few of your youthful illusions for a time. He rose, giving his hand. By the way, I hope you will give my sincerest congratulations to Miss... To Miss... Vane, Catherine Vane, said Latimer mechanically. His only thought at the moment was how soon he could get out of the room. Miss Vane, not one of the Newport Vanes, I presume. There were Vanes in Philadelphia, but I really don't seem to recall. He hesitated maliciously. Oh, you wouldn't know said Latimer, in a burst of careless irritation. She's working up at Columbia in the secretary's office. Then he stopped nervously. Why had he said that? Miss Catherine Vane, the secretary's office, Columbia University. Slake produced a gold pencil and made a note on his cuff. His eyes held Latimer straightly. The chill flame in them burned higher. What are you doing? said Latimer suddenly in a stifled terrified voice. Slake gestured in the air. Oh, nothing, Mr. Latimer, nothing. Merely a habit of mine, a notation, a little reminder. You see, his eyes glittered with bright and dancing flecks. You see, I have a whim, a whim of wishing to meet Miss Catherine Vane in person. I should like very much indeed, since you are so obdurate, to find out what she will say to this trifling experiment of mine.' 